Hey, 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 DJ Nubis. And DJ Nico. With you with another movie review. This time, 1986, I think, My Chauffeur. I believe that was the year it came out. I have to double check that. I think you're right. We are. It was 80, 80, 80. 86 or 87. Yeah. Um, Stars uh, Deborah Foreman and Sam Jones. Uh, Deborah Foreman, of course, uh, probably most notably known for the movie April Fool's Day, the horror film. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, of course, Sam Jones from Flash Gordon, which you haven't seen that doc yet. Uh, I think it's called I Am Flash. Uh, yeah, I Am Flash. We uh, watched it a few years ago. It's really, really good. Really good, actually. Uh, really personal. And uh, Sam Jones is a very cool guy. And it's kind of funny because he's like a bodyguard or something of that effect. He carries guns and shit to help protect people it's kind of funny uh but he doesn't shy away from his you know acting career what he did and it was really nice to see other people involved with that film talk about highly of him and the film of course and all that so i i think um what we learned though is you know sam kind of got into like a deep depression mm -hmm. and um you know he really i i just i guess he felt like he he w didn't get to where he wanted to be like as an actor so everything he was doing almost he, at one point he was thinking like it didn't mean anything so he was like oh everything i did was just but then these like comic cons started and he started like getting you know asked to be there and he started like appreciating and he has a really good family like um lots of kids and everything like they uh it, it really showed him who like he is more than he's just you know he's working and taking care of his family but it showed him that these movies were really important you know and my chauffeur is like really kind of like way different than flash flash it's despite like, having some of the comedy in there it was really kind of supposed to be kind of taken as a serious yeah fantasy, and it's like so. a superhero fantasy space opera type movie you know flash is the football player blah 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 um but Sam Jones is definitely Sam Jones in this movie. Yeah. Uh, my show for basically is a film about, uh, a, a f first off, uh, you got this corporation of limo drivers, uh, old school. They are very professional. They're very they, polite. Yeah. They, they, they do all the ass kissing. Yeah. Uh, uh, it doesn't matter what their clients want. They, if their clients want to, like, for instance, we'll get to the first guy, Catfight, who is He's a, a problem child for any driver. But, you know, the drivers generally just let him do whatever he wants, even if it's at the cost of his manager's frustration and stress. But uh, Deborah Foreman plays uh, Casey Meadows, and uh, she apparently has, like, uh, a connection to the Witherspoon, who's the main guy who runs this thing. Um, but Casey has been like, she was either given up for adoption or something, but she doesn't even know that they exist. So she's working in some like restaurant, restaurant as a dishwasher until and Witherspoon says, well, it's time to kind of let her, you know, get her back over here to kind of like, meet her or whatever it's it's like a process he has that he wants to see his child so he sends a letter uh which gets to her and invites her to be a driver for the limousine company and, uh, and they never really explained what happened to her mother right um yeah it doesn't it's, it doesn't go in depth it really jumps into it very fast mm -hmm. uh, and she's young i mean she what maybe 21 yeah that. yeah and and the thing is all the other drivers are men so they're all old they're like boomers or you, you hear a lot of they're the crack boomers because this is the 80s right so they're they're cracking jokes like you know we don't want no bras and panty in the men's area you know it's <laughs> like one of those things so when she's she's full of life she's energetic uh and nothing, and nothing really gets to her like they, they give her a bunch of shit and she's just like mm, whatever yeah she, she pretty much takes it you know and gives it back you know she's not she's not afraid to be herself and uh at the time of this she's definitely got early on like the whole like little madonna look going on as she's going to go interview for the job so uh no one else knows except for one other guy who's a driver knows who she is and how Witherspoon wants her to be a driver now you have the head guy who's running the driver, the dispatcher whatever he is so we first have a 
a meeting when she walks in like hey i'm here for a job and he's like you can't be your woman and then when she, he sees you, you know she he goes, thought I'm... it was mr because K- casey could be a boy or a girl's name so, so he's like well what's your name it's casey Madison. he's like yeah oh, oh shit so then he has a call and verified it. Indeed, she's there for a job. So, but she's put on probation, which is normal. Like, uh, you know, whether or not she can drive a, a limousine or whatever. But that kind of starts the thing where, you know, she gets sent off to her first assignment for her test, which is Catfight. Catfight is a, a singer of like a punk rock band. Oh, um, he's like, yeah, he has like two girls in his bed when she gets there. What, a typical like. Yeah, rock star. Yeah, you have to understand the time period this happened. You're gonna get a lot of TNA. Uh, we'll get to some surprise cameos that are in this, but, <laughs> but yeah, so the, the the humor is very much uh old school. So if you're easily offended, please don't watch it. Uh, if you're someone who can understand the time period this was made, you'll you'll get the jokes and the fun behind it, but uh, some people just don't, and that's that's okay. But yeah, because uh, some things, some of the jokes really didn't age that. No, great. It, the movie doesn't age that well at all. It, but I'd never seen it, and he remembered it from when he was younger. So during the Vinegar Syndrome um, Black Friday sale, he was looking, and I think this is one of the ones that um, yeah got put out. It got put out Blu-ray, and and uh, it hadn't ever been. And and yeah. uh, what uh, what we were learning about Vinegar Syndrome and. Um, What's the other one that went on the big one? Well, there's vinegar, and then you have stuff like Arrow or Umbrella. I mean, there's a lot of them out there that put on these Black Friday sales. And, but they um. But Vinegar Syndrome, what they do is they basically like I was talking with Aaron Pinnacles of Cinema a while back, a few a few days back, and Vinegar Syndrome already released like stuff that their ideas that they're going to do for their next release thing and it's like there's always hints so they um but they they like re-release these like because these right. are things that like they buy it so that they can re-release it under like the vinegar syndrome well the thing is i don't think my show forever had like a blu-ray release till now mm-hmm. that's that's the big deal okay me. so that's what happens is like roadhouse vinegar syndrome did one for that which is amazing i, I don't have it but i've seen the artwork and everything and it's amazing so oh, yeah it'd be kind of cool to have a stock? Uh, i don't think so i have to look um you know how I feel about but the other thing about these you have to understand is also these are limited to a certain amount of copies so once you purchase it that's it they don't ever usually reprint them so this, this is the other big deal about vinegar syndrome and some of these other places is that if, if you have um reddit i i like to go on reddit a lot because that's where if you're looking for information, you get like, I know there's always reviews on things online, Google reviews, but uh, a lot of reviews are, they skew positive, especially um, especially on like Amazon or Walmart or Google. And you'll see underneath it said this review was taken as a promotional, meaning that they gave them something for writing a review, whether it was a $25 gift certificate or something. I like to go on Reddit to get the real deal with if you're looking for help with something or if you're really trying to like get the skinny on a corporation or whatever. You the, There's a lot of people who speak really freely on Reddit. But there's also a lot, a lot of people on Reddit who have too much time on their hands. So what they tend to do, especially with vinegar syndrome, um, they keep track of how many copies are left for all of so they, somebody keeps a spreadsheet, a Google Docs spreadsheet that you can open. It'll be like such and such only has so many copies left. And and I, that's why we, I was on Vinegar Syndrome that the Black Friday night because everybody was taking guesses. And some people actually had, I don't know how they got this, but they had um, like advanced information mm-hmm. ahead of time. Yeah. So, but this is, this was our purchase that day. We didn't, I mean, we didn't go crazy. I know some people, they like, they're like, oh, this is brand new. I'm going to just go crazy and buy every single new title. Yeah. And sometimes, it's not necessary for us. We have a lot that we we've already bought. So. Right. Yeah. And I, I tend to look for either stuff that's obscure um, or we in this have. case, something that I really like that I probably should own. There's probably still a lot of DVDs, but, you know, we have so many interests between music, 
figurines, uh, spiders, spiders, <laughs> just various things. Concerts. So you have to kind of, yeah, you have to kind of pick and choose where you're going to put money at. And so, and also we've been really hitting some, um, amazing thrift stores that, uh, it, we went to this one and I think you picked up like 15 new DVDs and you're like, Hey, Oh, do we have this? Now granted, they're not Blu-ray, but you know, but they're the DVDs. Yeah. Some, I mean, there are some Blu-ray there and they, you know, depending on which, but we just could not believe that there were so many DVDs that we didn't have. And we're like, it's $2, yeah. you know, like, but anyway, back, back to the to review. My, yeah. Back to my chauffeur. So, uh, her first task is getting this this rock and roller to his his gig that night. So she gets there early. Uh, she walks into the apartment uh, that their hotel they're staying. Mm -hmm. It's like a rundown thing, and he's in bed with like three of the girls that are his like dancers or go go singers or whatever you want to call. It them. kind of reminds me of a place like um, when you see people who rent by the week, like yes. when they're poor, yeah. and that's ex and he's like apparently a big celebrity or some shit but he chooses like a crackhead hotel to stay in because he wants to drink and do drugs but he's like you know this british guy who you know doesn't give a fuck about much um so the minute she walks in she's like hey excuse me and they're all sleeping in the bed together and of course the girls are half nude or whatever and he's and like all shut up take off your clothes and get in the bed <laughs> you know and you know she's she's feisty for herself you know casey is so but just to give you an idea what this guy looks like, because it's pretty fucking funny. That's cat fight. Now the scene here is once she gets him out of bed, when she throws like a bucket of ice water on him, and then he falls over the railing and says "fuck," and then he, you know they get ready to go, and they get in a limousine. So as they're driving along. Uh, they want to play this. They have this game they play. About. I don't even know what the game like. It's like <laughs> something for points. It's almost like if you were thinking of like Death Race 2000, where they were killing people for my or for points. Mm -hmm. It's not quite as serious as that, but here's one of the things where people would get a little offended. Uh, they stop, and he's like, "Oh, there's a big fat lady with a blue dress and a dog. We need her panties." And the dog was blue, and the lady was wearing blue, so they needed to steal the underwear. So that was apparently one of the tasks for twenty thousand points or something. So he gets out, and he's like, "They're in the middle of a park," and so he's like, "Give me those panties," you know, in his British accent. And she's the fat lady's like, "No," and then she starts swinging the dog as a weapon. Uh, eventually, he gets them, but. Uh, it's just it's really corny uh the girl casey finally gets him to the show on time which the manager appreciates this is uh, something that happens a couple of times where the dispatcher for the limo guys is like look we have all these complaints uh we should be firing you but the manager walks in and says hey your lady was the first one to ever get my client to a show on time so here's like a 500 tip that she gave him or he gave her and you know especially Okay, whatever. We're gonna... Yeah, the dispatcher, he's like the manager of the group. Yeah. He's like doing everything he can to set her up to fail because yeah. he's like irritated that he has to have this female. Um, yeah, chauffeur. too much energy. Yeah. Yeah, all the old guys like to sit in their little room and play, play cards. Poker. Right. And they, it's like the old school way. They don't want change. And so, uh, so we kind of go through this a little bit. She takes different jobs. Um, now, in the meantime, Jones is Mr. Witherspoon's son. And he's very serious, straight laced, uh, hard nosed. So early in the film, we see him with his uh, fiance. Well, that, but his his people that work for him. Oh yeah. So yeah, he's yeah. very very you know like the one woman, which there's a nicer moment later, but the one woman comes up saying that she was a little bit late, and he didn't give a shit. He was like really giving her a hard time about it. It's like you know you can't be late, and you know just acting like a real dick. He didn't need that for everybody that works for him. Uh, then he runs into problems with his his uh, girlfriend fiance who is leaving him for someone else. Like, and she was pregnant, remember? Yeah. And it was the other guy's baby. So, uh, and this happens in a limousine while Casey's driving. So, uh, once the fiance is gone, uh, she's like, "Do you want a drink?" Because they have obviously a stock bar in those cars. Uh, he's like, "I don't drink," and they says, "Till today." Mm -hmm. and so then we lead to this, <laughs> which, you know, I, 
when we rewatched it, like the scene itself is a little bit annoying because he's carrying on. He's, he's acting like he's on PCP or something. He's like really drunk, and he's like, "Ah, what a bit!" And she's mimicking his cry, so it's like a really annoying thing between the two of them. Uh, but that leads to probably one of the funnier scenes in the movie because he jumps out of the car. Uh, they're by a park, and he's like stripping naked and running through the park. And people are like, couples are like picnicking. And the one moment I, I kind of pointed out to her right away is like she he sneaks up on a woman pushing her baby in a cart and takes the cart and starts running around. With it. And then we had like a Dr. Roxo moment because he's sitting there and the cops start going. He's like, he's like, uh oh. And he starts he runs running. back to the limo. And she kept saying, like, she, he gets back in the limo and he's really, really oh, drunk. Yeah, he's and she's like, where's your wallet? Where do you live? And finally i guess she just took him to her house yeah to her right and so he wakes up the next day not really knowing well he knows who she is but he, you know he's like he's like back to his old self he's yeah like, he's like oh i'm not commuting with the help or something like right that. <laughs> so he gets dressed and leave and she's kind of pissed off and they really don't hear much at that point after that but uh another cool scene that we see later is you know there's like this like small cafe or something outside that she goes to to get coffee or whatever while she's off duty or in between jobs and uh we see a young black guy with his his girl and they're going to somewhere and fancy she's all dressed up and ready to go but his ride fell through he couldn't get the... well, he was supposed to be buying a car and she and the girlfriend is really disappointed and then she starts ragging on him like who's going to give you a car loan and then yeah he's like well my... he's trying to go to college he's working and then he was like his uncle was supposed to give him a ride and she's like well and then she's like he she he said well we can take the bus and she's like i'm not taking the bus all dressed up like this and she was just disappointed and yeah, it was really kind of like a, you, you feel bad for him. Like, it's like... He's trying so hard. Yeah, he's, he's like really in nice school guy. and he's working and then this girl's like ragging on him and... But then Casey witnesses this and, you know, behind the scenes she goes and gets a Rolls Royce uh, limo and pulls up and then pretends that she's this ride that, you know, he had ordered and, you know, she was late. And so the guy catches on quickly that she just did it to be nice to him, which I thought was a really nice scene. Uh, because the the girl obviously is very fascinated with the car. She's like, Oh, that's okay. And she's getting in and she's all happy and, and she feels special. Right. And it's I thought I missed something because I um I didn't know why she did it. Remember, I was like, does, does she know him? And you're just like, no, I think that Casey, just the type of person she is, she was like, yeah. just trying to help a guy out. Like she, yeah. she saw him and kind of felt like, yeah, I'm really just. Just felt bad for him. Yeah. It's like, look, if there's no job she's going to, like, it's not going to kill her to take this guy to wherever they're going. Yeah, and they're not, they obviously weren't going that far. And I think you know, she was just having a coffee yep. and she didn't have anywhere to go. So, and that, and that's kind of the thing because like, again, we, it's, it's unfortunate by the end of the movie. We don't like some of the guys that are there start to like her. Obviously they, they start to warm up to her, but you never really kind of see if there's any kind of real change really. Uh, because that's not the really kind of, it's not a deep movie in that respect. No, it's a silly movie. There is lots of stuff where uh, they're just, singing and dancing and right. having a good time and i was telling him um i said this reminds me of tough turf like there's so many bar scenes in in tough turf where there's and there's like a dance off and, yeah. and I, yeah and the thing is like you know the budgets for these probably were not very big so that's part of the reason why you're not going to have like this very in-depth plot like it's just gonna and, and the way the 80s movies were mm -hmm. they all kind of ran like this like it's really fast and you know you weren't gonna get much deep it's just, thought into it it's just no plot it just you you there's a beginning middle end and you're done right i i think when we did watch tough turf and review it um on the podcast i read somewhere that after footloose and the success of Footloose, like, and this was a movie that they didn't expect to be like super successful. Um, they, every movie after, not every, but a majority of the movies after felt like they had to have some kind of musical scene. 
in their movie because they thought that would like take it over the top and that would make people want to watch it more. But they did that with Roadhouse too at mm -hmm. the end, same thing. You know, you got um, Jeff Healy there. He was in the movie, mm -hmm. but again, he was playing the music at the end. They were rolling the credits. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that kind of that like era of movies was really kind of follow trying to follow that same formula. Mm -hmm. But the whole thing about Footloose, the movie was literally about dancing, dancing. Yeah. like you're not allowed to dance you're in this town that's like super religious so it had like a bit of a meteor plot and you have people who were a little bit more um what's the right word not in depth but like i, I don't know but i think with these fluffier movies even if you think to like back to like pretty in pink mm -hmm. and and those oh breakfast club all that well i think the breakfast club is pretty deep but like the, but it is but, but you not, know what i mean like yeah. these these other fluffier movies that's the idea you just want you just want a good time you want a, a happy ending a beginning middle and end mm -hmm. and to be entertained and that's right. one thing that the 80s movies really they did that great they did a lot of action great they did the that's all it was about really is action movies you know arnie sylvester and so on and then like you had all these other subset movies but, horror movies were the same way it's like we don't care about plot we just want stabbings and dying exactly it, you know? and now every movie is four hours because you need to find out the killer's backstory and you <laughs> we really don't need it all the time because we've all we've accepted it with other oh, we still have plenty of bad horror films but uh yeah they i think from the 90s like when you started getting stuff like silence of the lambs it really kind of started broadening this a little bit deeper plot lines and, and stuff like that. I mean, you had that in the 80s, but it was mostly stuff that no one cared about because action films and horror and everything was a lot bigger than, like, the 90s kind of, like, started going off in other areas. More like um, drama, drama and thriller mysteries. The It's kind of interesting because I feel like the 90s is really what kind of gave birth to that um, rom-com, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And these other, like, I keep saying fluffy, but like these types of movies would kind of like, like this, like my chauffeur, you kind of would consider it a rom-com, but it's not the same feeling. Right. So these eighties movies have taken their own, like, um, subgenre themselves. I, I mean, there, you, you're not going to call it a, it is a comedy and it is, you know, a romance, but you, when you think rom-com, you're thinking of the stuff happening from the nineties. Yeah. Know? If you took basically, I know exactly what you're saying. So if you took like St. Elmo's fire, uh, which was done very much mm -hmm. fast paced, but there was some serious content. Now, if you were to remake it, it would be much longer, probably another half hour mm -hmm. longer and they would go, a little bit deeper with the acting and everything else to make it a, a bit uh, more polished than what you would see in the original film. So that makes sense. Uh, but yeah, these rom-coms of the 80s were much shorter. They weren't drawn out. And really, even some of the serious things that were happening in these, these 80s films weren't as bad as you get. Like So if you have something like, um, I don't know, uh, The Holiday or... Uh, what was the one we just watched? Love Actually. So they are a little bit more sad in the sense that they do they, those scenes. Yeah, like and they play on your heartstrings right, and yeah. all. Um, they, the ones in the 80s were like, okay, uh, this bad. Because we have that moment in this where, uh, so we'll get back on track with here. So basically, Mr. Witherspoon tells his son, you know, you're too serious, dude. I need you to go take a vacation to the cabin out wherever. Uh, and I'm going to have a driver take you out there. So, again, Casey's paired up with uh, Sam Jones' character. And she's still, this is the funny thing, he will not tell her his name right, at right, all. Right, so they head out, and of course, he's still dickish here. So when the car starts to overheat, she has to pull over and stop and tell him, like, we can't continue right now until this cools down. He's like, just keep driving. He has no understanding that the car is going to break down on him if they keep down. So she's like... Okay, fuck it. So she so starts driving. Blow, we're gonna blow a gasket, and he's like, "You stop driving when I say stop right. driving." Like so, he had his attitude. Of course, what happens is the car breaks down, and for whatever reason, he decides he's gonna start walking to wherever to find. He saw that cabin. Yeah. And he's like, "Yeah, I saw this uh, farmhouse, and I'm gonna walk to this farmhouse." And so he, she follows. Casey's like, "No, we're not gonna. It's it's." it's what 20 miles that way and he's like yeah yep so 
they do this little game where he's just walking like a zombie straight to it and she's following she's kind of goofy for a while but didn't realize it's like they could be in serious trouble because it's really hot out there and it's getting dark and then it starts raining and she doesn't like the rain doesn't like being wet so she starts she hurts her ankle and she's kind of pouting he decides oh, okay yeah now i gotta be like a man and i'll pick her up and we'll take it to the cabin and from there their romance starts happening and to kind of push this along uh, he he, he pr actually proposes to her that night. So like, wham, man, thank you, man, but we, let's get married because he's really happy with it. He's then, like a changed guy. And he's, she's like, what is your name? And he's like, it doesn't matter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for whatever reason, he keeps avoiding it. He's like, just just marry me. And then I, and part, and now granted, part of that is he didn't want her to know who he was because he did come from money and he wasn't sure if she was going to be like taken by that because Witherspoon is the person she works for. Now she met his dad under a different name, Roosevelt, who wanted to see her in person because, of course, he was with his her mother at one point, who we find out later was like one of the handmaids of the house. So he kind of cheated on his wife with her, but we'll get to that. Uh, so they they end up getting together, having some sex, and uh, romance builds from there. And so he keeps trying to propose to her, but she's playing coy and like, no. Even one cute moment, she's doing the Neko thing with the shit on her face. So and she had a mask and has, has curlers in her and hair. And all these guys bring in, like, flowers Roses. and they're playing yeah. violins. And he's like, marry me. She's like, no. No, with all the shit on her face. Um, so then, real quickly, we did have a cameo from a couple of guys at the time who I know didn't know who they were until a couple of years later. Uh, and that is these two gentlemen, Penn and Teller. If you don't know who they are, uh, have been a tag team for quite a long time. Yeah, they do comedy and magic, and and I didn't even know that Teller was really, uh, or is it Penn? Which one? I can't remember which one's which. I but can't either. I think Penn might be the one that's deaf or mute. No, I, I thought it was Teller. Might be. I thought Penn is the. Oh my God, we sound. Yeah, like Penn. Idiots. Penn is the guy, the bigger guy, the taller guy. Yeah. yeah. So they were in this film, and I didn't know who they were at the time, but they were funny and. Um, Teller's playing a sheik who is supposed to be like going to the embassy. And at this point, Penn is like just some random dude on the street who basically most of the time tries to finagle money out of these guys. So he sneaks into the limo while Casey's letting the sheik in. And that's when Penn starts going to his spiel, like playing these games. And he tells her that he's the American bodyguard. bodyguard. So he takes. Instead of going to the embassy, Penn convinces her to take him to a club. And that's where, you know, Penn starts throwing these girls at uh, tell the Sheik because, you know, he's trying to get the Sheik to loosen up and have fun. And, of course, he's spending all his money in this, this wallet. He says, I'm your bodyguard. I'll hold on to this wallet for you. I got this. I got this covered. You're good. Uh, but by the end of it, uh, after the girls in the car showing some boobies and uh, the whole thing, uh, there's like this nice moment again between he, the characters where uh he, he gives him his wallet back he said we spent all your cash but your cards tonight. are here and he gives it back and of course earlier in the night Penn had tried to get the ring from him but he didn't give him the ring but at the end uh i think because he gave the him the watch remember he gave him his right. watch but the sheik was so appreciative about the great night like he probably was like this is better than the mc i was getting to see lice nudie women and dance and so he gives him the ring and there's like this nice moment so that takes care of that part so then we get to the end of the film and uh sam jones is i forget the, the guy's name the character's name but he brings in casey well, he hardly ever says it right that's so why brings in casey to meet his father and at this point uh casey thinks it's mr roosevelt who she met earlier in the film mm -hmm. that's when uh mr wisdom like well i'm a little bit of both so uh because he does go by Roosevelt through some other companies. It's kind of weird. But uh, so he explains to Casey and his son that, you know, Casey is, you know, he's first like, do you recognize this room? And then Casey starts looking around. It's like, yeah, I used to play here as a little girl. And then she realizes she used to play with Sam Jones as a young child. And so at first they're kind of like, yeah, you know, yeah. And then she's like, yeah, I'm going to marry you. But then the father's like, well, no, 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 that can't happen because you're actually brother and sister. <laughs> and and then, like, there's, what? Yeah, then there's this moment like, uh-oh. 
we and were, Case we is like, bang. yeah, Case, Case is like, oh, we've been bad. And like, <laughs> Sam just like, very bad. Uh, but quickly and nicely, so it doesn't get really weird. Uh, there was another driver who used to was giving Casey a hard time while she was there throughout the movie, and uh, one of Mr. Wozman's right hand man drivers, who's been very nice to Casey throughout the film, brings this guy in who's like a cranky old fella, and he tells him that he's got to tell Mr. Weatherspoon something. So what he does is he says, uh, "The girl's not your father. Uh, the girl's not your daughter. She's mine." And apparently this cranky dude had sex with her mother as well. Prior. And so did the other guy. He's like, yes, right. yes. She was quite the woman. And so <laughs> it, apparently she got around with a lot of people uh, in that film. Uh, so it, it ends well with them both getting married. And, uh, you know, which is funny because the dispatcher manager guy ends up being the one driving away from the church after their marriage. <laughs> um, but it, it's a fun, silly film. And it's still fun to me, you know, even now going, looking way back to it. I was, it was worth watching. I, you know, I'd never seen it and, you know, I like 80s movies. So, um, trust me, she's seen some films that I like and she's like, this is garbage. I don't know what We were, was it, he was trying to show me because he saw the, um, while I was away, he saw the Weird Al yeah. movie with, uh, Daniel. She didn't even get to the first. I said, this is the worst thing I've ever seen. But see, I was like. Once I I watched it the first time, like I don't really understand what's happening here because I thought this was like a serious doc, but the, the reality is it's not. He's mocking docs, and he's mocking himself, and he's mocking his because the stuff that happens, Cause, yeah, because it's not real, but it's it so like over the top, and it's so like I don't know. She just couldn't get it. I was like, this is not good. So we're probably not gonna do a review for that, even though I'd love to do one just because it's so corny, but. Uh, Our next review probably will be Elvis because we watched that finally. Yeah. Like, we have been holding on to that one for a long time. I've flown several times since this movie has been out, and it's always on the plane, and I always just make sure I don't watch it. And I remember over the summer, I was um, staying with my aunt and uncle at their place, and I had like a whole weekend planned with my cousins and stuff, but you know, my aunt and uncle were watching Elvis and they're like, Oh, you can watch it. And I'm like, I can't, I promise Scott and I are going to watch it together. We really want to see this movie together. And I stuck to it. He stuck to it. And we knew it was a long movie. So we didn't want to like, <laughs> yeah, I think we got to bed at like 1am mm-hmm. last night, but it was, it was decent. I, I think I gave that. Well, I'll wait till we we'll wait until it. we review it. We can, um, we'll do another one another day about Elvis before. Yeah. There's, I, there's a couple other films I want to watch. Uh, some of them are a little bit, older horror films that I want to watch with her and review, but uh, we'll figure it out as we go because you know she'll be leaving soon again. So, mm-hmm. But thank you all for checking this out. Um, I do highly recommend you check it out. If you enjoy a lot of the 80s films, this is one of the better ones that are out there uh, in terms of this it kind of film. It is very 80s. Yeah. Like if- yeah. And it's a lot of fun. It is fun. Sam Jones and Deborah Foreman are great in this. Um, I forget some of the other names, but you'll probably recognize a couple of the other guys in this film. Uh, they're people you've seen in other films over the course of the year. So thanks again, folks. I hope you enjoyed it and take care of yourselves. And we'll see you next time. Click. Just